I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and I do want to teach today. Romans 12, verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Wow. I mean, we could, we could take this scripture and preach it for a year. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who, who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be full of yourself. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, you're, you're still the funniest looking person I've ever seen in my life. And you need help. So don't be full of yourself. Don't repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If, here it is. My key verse, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, everybody say on me, live at peace with everyone. Everybody say everyone. Everybody say everyone. Everybody say that means everyone. That means my husband. That means my wife. That means my neighbor. That means the person who drives me crazy. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Wow. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Somebody just spoke in tongues. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> hmm. And last week we began a brand new series entitled, You Make Me Crazy. Do you know anybody that makes you crazy? And we want to build good relationships in our life. So it's really a series of messages on building good, strong relationships in our life. And last week we discovered that our relationship with God always determines our relationship with other people. When our relationship is right with God, our relationship with others is right. Number two, our relationship with others determines our or defines or describes our relationship with God. As John says, how can you say that you love God but you hate your brother? He said it's impossible. You cannot hate your brother and love God at the same time. And then thirdly, our relationship with ourself will always define and determine our relationship with God and others. You've got to love yourself in the right way. As Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. There's nothing wrong with understanding that God has put inside of you a love for yourself in a good way. You've got to understand what God is saying to you, who you are in Christ. And the truth is, we learned last week that we make people crazy in our life. And if we're going to have good relationships, if we're going to have strong relationships, we're going to have to first focus on ourself. We're going to have to take responsibility for the reasons why people sometimes make us crazy and sometimes... People make us crazy because we're prejudiced. Sometimes people make us crazy because we're insecure or we're proud or we're arrogant. And so, so it's really on the inside of us. And so we've got to take the splinter or the log out of our own eye before we can try to take the splinter out of our brother or sister's eye. And so it starts with us. And so I pray that last week you said, Lord, I want to have deep, good, positive, strong relationships. And Lord, start with me, Lord. 
Lord, if there's something inside of me that's not right, Lord, start with me so that I can have good relationships. And so we start with us, but the truth is even when we start with us, there are people who drive us crazy. We all have somebody who pushes our buttons in our life. We all have somebody who, who really gets under our skin. They, they stretch and they test our Christianity. They stretch our sanctification. Listen to me. Here's the truth. The truth is there are people in my life that test my sanctification. I want to lay hands on them, and it's not holy hands. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, they, I want to baptize them and hold them down a little longer and send them to heaven. You know what I'm saying? Now nobody's going to get water baptized here in Bethlehem. At least they're going to ask, is Pastor Steve baptizing? I want to help them to see Jesus before they want to see Jesus. <laughs> but but the, the difficult people in my life are people that make me most like God. That's what I learned. I discovered that the people that are the most difficult in my life, they show me what's in the inside of who I am, and they test me, and they take me to another level when it comes to being like God, because Jesus said, don't only love the neighbors that you get along with, but love your enemies and pray for your enemies. And Paul is actually echoing what the, his Lord and Savior told him to do, and that was bless those who persecute you and overcome evil with doing good. Come on, somebody say amen. So Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 9, love must be sincere. It can't be fake. We can't pretend to love God and hate other people. We can't pretend that everything's okay when there's unresolved conflict in our life. Paul goes on to say, hate what's evil, cling to what is good. In other words, hate hypocrisy, despise falsehood, hate lying and deceiving, hate gossip and slander and backbiting and cling to what is good. Now the Greek word for cling means to glue together, to cement, to adhere, to fasten together. So we, we cling to honesty because it, 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 it's the glue of relationships. We, we cling to unity. We cling to peace. We cling to love. We cling to harmony. We cling to what is good because it's the glue. It's the mortar between the bricks. It's the glue that cements our relationships. You cannot have good relationships without integrity and honesty and trust. Come on, somebody help me out. Paul tells us how to do that. He says, by being devoted to one another in love and honor one another above yourself. He said, honor is a huge thing. Honor is a huge thing. And what we're missing in our world today is honor. We really are. We're missing it in politics. We're missing it in the church. We don't know how to honor one another. You're not, you're not supposed to just honor the pastor. You're supposed to honor each other. In fact, we're supposed to honor people and treat them better than ourselves. Isn't that what it says in Philippians chapter 2? That we're to consider others even better than ourselves. Wow, wow. Can you imagine what this world would be like if we treated people with such honor that we would actually prefer them over ourselves? That just, that's just, that's just totally goes against the flesh. It totally goes against our human instinct to put ourselves first. He said, never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. He says, share with the Lord's people everything that you have and those that are in need. Make sure that you... Give them what they need. Practice hospitality. That means open up your house, your home. Cook some pasta fazool or matzah fazool or curry goat or whatever you cook. And, and, and be hospitable and love people. That's why we have one group. That one group of people once a month for at least one year having one meal together. Understanding that we're one group of people that love and care for one another on a daily basis. Then Paul echoes the words of Jesus. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them. Don't, don't curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. 
in music, harmony is the blending of different notes to make one beautiful sound. Harmony is working together. It's not uniformity, it's harmony. Harmony is not making everyone dress the same way. Harmony is not making everyone speak the same language. Harmony is not making everyone go through the same exact way and not saying that we, 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 we can find different paths to heaven, but it's meaning that we all find, at some point, we all find Jesus in our way. Not, not against the word of God or not in contradictory to the word of God. What I'm saying is, is we all have different stories. We all have different lives. We all have different personalities. We all have different gifts. And, and, and when we put that all together, we have unity, harmony. So we're singing different notes, but we're singing to the same Lord, the same master, the same king. And as a result of that, we make beautiful harmony. He said, don't be proud. Be humble. Humility is the key to harmonious relationships. Listen to me. Pride always kills relationships. Someone is too proud to ask for forgiveness. Someone is too proud to admit that they're wrong. Someone's too proud to forgive someone who hurt them. Somebody is too proud to stop and really listen and understand. He said, be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be full of yourself, he said. Don't think more highly of yourself. Be humble and work through the conflicts in your life. Why? Because the truth is one of the greatest reasons why so many people make us crazy or we make people crazy is because we've never learned how to work through conflict in our life. There are people who live every day of their life in unresolved conflict. There are people that live every day of their life with pain and hurt and sorrow and anger and unforgiveness in their heart. And let me tell you something. It's making them sick spiritually. It's making them sick emotionally. It's making them sick physically. There are more people that go to the doctor because of anxiety, because of stress, because of depression over unresolved issues in their life than anything else. The most difficult thing that somebody has to go through in their life is an unresolved conflict that they don't know how to resolve. You know, when we go to school, the first thing we should learn is how to deal with unresolved conflict. Unfortunately, children don't know how to deal with unresolved conflict in their life. And listen, conflict starts really early in life. I mean, think about it. Right from the beginning of life, we as humans are, are facing conflict in our life. It happens in the sandbox. It happens with our siblings. It happens with other kids in school. It happens with our parents. And there are conflicts all around us, all of our life. There's conflict at work. There's conflict in our marriage. There's conflict in our families. There's conflict with our boss. There's conflict with our boyfriend or our girlfriend. There's conflict in the world. There's conflict in this country. There's conflict in our community. There's conflict in the church. There's conflict in the economy. There's conflict all around. Why? Because we live in a falling, dysfunctional world. I faced conflict this week, and I had to work through conflict in my own life, right? All of us deal with conflict in our life. And the reason why we deal with conflict is because we're all dysfunctional. We're all sinful. We all have issues in our life. And when you put dysfunctional people together, you're bound to have conflict. Conflict is inevitable. I want you to say that with me. Conflict is inevitable. Inevitable. The truth is you can't run away from conflict. You can't run away from change. You can't run away from conflict. Conflict will always be a part of your life. Why? Because we're dysfunctional, we're sinful, and we're different from one another. And conflict doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing. My wife and I are totally different. Night and day, you couldn't get two people that are totally different temperamentally than me and my wife. Now, our values are the same. That's what keeps us together. Our values are the same. We love Jesus. Jesus comes first in our life. You see, there are godly relationships and ungodly relationships. Jesus comes first. 
So no matter whether or not we're the same temperament, God is in the center and he keeps us moving in the same direction. Our values is the same when it comes to finances. Our values are the same when it comes to life, right? But we temperamentally are totally two different people. I'm a sanguine. I like to be with a lot of people. I like crowds. I like to be out there. I, people give me energy. I like to be the comedian. I like to be the center. I, like, I love it, man. It just give me more people. I love it. I like to be with people. Boom, 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 boom. My wife, it's not that she doesn't like to be with people. She's a melancholy, phlegmatic. She's more shy. She's more introverted. She's more detailed. Let me tell you something. I say this all the time. If I didn't have my wife in my life, can you imagine two Steve Malalos living together? <laughs> Holy mackerel. You talk about driving each other crazy. There would be really bad communication and we would be in the poor house because I'd give away all my money. She'd give away all her money. We wouldn't even know where it was. No, I'm just kidding. But the truth is, she is a very detailed oriented person. I need her in my life. She thinks about things that I don't think about. She sees things that I don't see. So I, I'm in the car with her. I'm like, honey, this is what we're going to do. Yes, we're going to do it. And when are we going to do it? Tomorrow. And she says, did you think about this? Did you think about that? Did you think about, oh, stop being so negative. <laughs> has nothing to do with being negative. It has to do with being wise. Didn't Jesus say when you want to build a house, you got to think about, do you have bricks? Do you have mortar? Do you have money? <laughs> How are you going to do this? I don't know. <laughs> wow, it's amazing. So we live in a, in a world filled with conflict because people are different. But conflict in itself is not necessarily bad. It's just what it is in a lot of times. And the truth is some people are making you crazy because you've never learned how to resolve conflict in your life. It's eating up, you up alive. Some of you hate conflict and you avoid it at all costs. Some of you love conflict and you're eating everybody else up alive around you. You live on that. You thrive on that. You like to eat people up and spit them out. Come on, somebody. Now listen to me. One of the most important skills that you need to learn in your life is how to resolve conflict. Why? Because conflict resolution is critical to your health and your happiness. I want you to say with me, conflict resolution is critical to my health and my happiness. Conflict resolution is critical to your spiritual well-being. It's critical and vitally important to, 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 to your ability to keep yourself from going crazy in your life or driving other people crazy. And if you don't learn how to resolve conflict in a biblical Christ-like way, you will go crazy. Mark my words. So this morning, for a few moments, I want to teach you seven biblical principles about conflict resolution. Are you ready? Come on, take something out and begin to write, because this is important stuff. I want you to teach this to your children. In Romans chapter 12, Paul tells us the secret of great relationships, and they come from several things, and we're going to unpackage them today. Notice, notice what he says right off the bat. Notice what he says. We, we looked at it before, but notice. He says, don't repay evil for evil. He said, be careful to do what is right in everyone's eyes. <clears throat> and he says, key thing here, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Wow. That's the core of what Paul is trying to say in Romans chapter 12, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, Paul tells us two things before he commands us to live at peace with everyone. He says, if it is possible. Isn't it good? Don't you understand? As we're looking at this, Paul the apostle tells us that before we can live at peace with everyone, number one, we need to recognize that it is possible. In the Greek, it actually means that we can see that there's a possibility to live at peace. Now, it doesn't always mean that everyone's going to be living at peace with us. But it does mean that we can live at peace in ourselves with everyone. That's really important, isn't it? You see, there are some people that are very difficult. And they are peace breakers. Three kinds of people in this world. I say it all the time. Peacemakers, peace fakers, peace breakers. 
And you got to ask yourself a question. Are you a peacemaker, a peace faker, a peace breaker? And some people love to break peace, right? So he says it's, if it's possible. In other words, there are some people who are troublemakers. They're crazy makers. They're violent. They will hate you, despise you, and want to destroy you. They will refuse to be at peace with anyone in their life. And the truth is some people who are crazy make other people crazy. They don't want peace. They don't want harmony. They don't want conflict. They want war. They, they want pain and suffering. They want sorrow. And that's the kind of person that you've got to understand. Even though they want all of those things, you could still be at peace inside yourself. That's really important. No one... No one should be able to steal the peace that God wants to put in your heart. Nobody. You can't blame it on anyone else. Because Jesus tells us that he gives us peace, not as the world gives it, as he gives it. And peace is a fruit of the Spirit. And so even if the world is chaotic, even if there's a troublemaker, a crazy maker in your life, you can still be at peace within. Come on, somebody. Now, obviously, there's some techniques and skills to help you to, to do that. Sometimes you have to put boundaries up. Sometimes you've got to know when to say no. Sometimes you've got to know when to walk away. Sometimes you've got to know when to stop speaking and keep silent. And let the Holy Spirit work on the situation. Sometimes you've got to cut off relationship. Listen, sometimes you have to do what you have to do because you understand that this person does not want peace in their life. But there is no possible way to resolve conflict with them, perhaps right now. But Paul says, whatever the case, don't hate them back. He said, don't repay evil for evil. Don't allow it to make you bitter. Don't allow them to overcome your peace in your life. He said, overcome evil with good. Don't allow them to pull you into their world. A lot of people want to pull you into their world. They want to pull you down, make you like them. He said, be like Jesus. Pray for them. Forgive them. Keep your heart free from bitterness and unforgiveness in your life. It may mean that you might need to even remove yourself from that situation. Why? Because you march to a different beat. You're living a totally different world. You're living in a different world. You're living in God's world. And you're the light and they are the darkness and they're filled with hate and you are filled with love. But while you cannot get along with them, you need to respect them and you need to respect yourself and you need to be at peace with your own heart toward them. You cannot have bitterness towards anybody in your heart. That's why when they were crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord overcame. Listen, he overcame evil with good. How did he, come, how did he overcome evil with good? He prayed for them. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And let me tell you, let me put it into perspective. There's a lot of people in your life that are crazy makers. And you might really think that they know what they do. But a lot of them are just so bound and blinded by the enemy that they can't really help themselves. Hurt people hurt people. And hurt is passed down from one generation to the next generation. And so sometimes we've got to understand that these people, they just really need prayer because they don't know what they're doing. But notice Paul does tell us, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you. Live at peace with everyone. The truth is you and I often have a choice to make. You and I often can be a part of the solution. But sometimes we need to look deep within our own souls and ask ourselves the question, do we really want peace with that person? Come on now, let's be honest. You know, sometimes we walk away too soon, too fast. We cut off the relationship too soon, too fast. Because the truth is, we really don't want to work through the issue. We give up on people too soon because we really don't want to put the work into reconciliation. It takes work. It takes courage. It takes spirituality. 
It takes the Holy Spirit work inside. It takes dying to ourselves. And it's so much easier to walk away from a relationship and start again. We have a world filled with people who want to just start again, over and over again. You know, and they get divorced after the divorce after the, you know what? You can't get away from yourself and you take all the baggage with you from that relationship. You got to make sure that you deal with the situation so that you don't carry it into the next relationship. Somebody help me out today. We want to take the easy way out. Listen to me. The easiest thing we could do is blame the other person and move on from the conflict. But Paul tells us that a true believer, a true follower of Christ does everything they can all the time in every way to resolve the conflicts that are in their life. They don't take the easy way out. They don't make excuses. They don't blame other people. They don't just move on. They refuse to be overcome with evil. They do what is right. They live at peace with everyone. So, so how... Can we live at peace with people? How can we resolve conflict in our life? Paul tells us, number one, if it's possible and as it lies within yourself. In other words, you've got to ask yourself the question, do you really want to resolve this conflict? Be honest. Be honest. Do you really want to resolve this issue with this person? Or is there bitterness and hatred in your heart? Listen, I want to tell you something. I... I've, I've had to deal with conflict. I deal with conflict all, all the time. Miscommunication. Misunderstanding. Two women that you always have to avoid in your life. Miscommunication. Misunderstanding. But sometimes I just can't avoid miscommunication. She walks into my office and she's in my face. And misunderstanding. Because we're human beings. And I, I'm always miscommunicating. I'm misfiring. I am. You know, because I'm not great at communication. You know, we want to say that we're great at communication. This is, look, look, this is one-way communication. I talk, you listen. Don't say a word. <laughs> That's not great communication. That's just a lecture or sermon. It gets challenging when I say something and you say, but, 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 but. And then you have your opinion and I have my opinion. And then I have my point of view and you have your point of view. And then all of a sudden it goes from communication to miscommunication walks in the room and sits right in the middle of us too. And miscommunication gets on the phone and calls misunderstanding and invites her into the conversation. <laughs> now we've got four people in the room. <laughs> and as a result, there's conflict. And man, I'm telling you what. I would love to avoid the conflict. I would lo- And there have been times when I have. And it just makes it worse. It always, always makes it worse when you choose to avoid the conflict. When you choose to pretend it's not there. So why is it important to to resolve conflict in our life? Because unresolved conflict actually has three damaging results in our lives. Number one, I want you to write this down. Unresolved conflict creates disharmony between us and God. It hinders our relationship with God. Why? Because John told me, I can't love God if I hate my brother. So I go to God and I want to pray and I want to seek God. But there's there's a wedge. There's there's a block. God's not speaking to me. The, The anointing of God's not flowing. And the reason why it's not flowing is because I've got bitterness, unresolved conflict in my heart. And God said, listen, you want to come to the altar and you want to worship me? He said, you better go make it right with your brother first because, listen, I'm not going to talk to you until you make that right. And I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of people that are dealing with unresolved conflict and bitterness in their heart. And they come every week to this altar and they pray for God. They heal their body. And God is not going to do it until you let go of that bitterness in your heart. I'm telling you right now. It's a biblical principle. So it hinders our relationship. It hinders our prayers. Did you know that unresolved conflict prevents 
us from getting un our prayers answered. Notice what it says in Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner. Now, he's not talking about intellectually weak. We know that. Listen to me. I am convinced that God made man, and then he said, I can do a little better, and he made woman. I'm just, I'm just being honest. <laughs> Women are so much smarter and so much prettier. Come on. You know, so, so women are not weaker in the sense that they are intellectually or emotionally or spiritually, even physically weaker. I mean, men, let's get a life here. They're the ones who bear children. I would never want to do that. Praise God. Yeah. After my wife delivered three, three daughters, I thought to myself, thank you, Jesus, that I was born a man. <laughs> But, but, but he, in, he's talking about in that society, men were raised up or in some ways men went before women and it was wrong and they didn't treat women the right way. But in that society, Paul was saying, you could take advantage of your wife because in this society, she's considered the weaker. That's not true. Not anymore because in Christ, we're all equal. Amen. Praise the Lord. Somebody say amen to that. All the women said I mean, I didn't hear any women. I mean, that should have been like, amen. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that the man shouldn't be the head of the home. But it has nothing to do with being equal. It has to do with position. Come on, somebody. Hello. So, so, so the Bible says that we are to respect our wives as heirs with us of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Notice that. Unresolved conflict, men, with your wife will hinder your prayer. Let me just say it really frank with you today, men. If you're not treating your wife right, God is not obligated to answer your prayer. Hello? So you better go home and start treating your wife right. Happy wife, happy life, happy wife, happy God. Go home and treat your wife right, and your prayers will be ready to be answered. Unresolved conflict hinders healthy living. It causes all kinds of unhealthy symptoms in us, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Someone once said this is an enormous physical burden to being hurt and disappointed. Karen Swartz, director of the Mood Disordered Adult Consultation Clinic at John Hopkins University said this, chronic anger puts you in, into a flight, fight or flight mode, which results in numerous changes in heart rate, blood pressure, and immune response. Those changes then increase the risk of depression, heart disease, diabetes, among other conditions, forgiveness, however, calm stress levels leading to improved health. Can you imagine that? Jesus knew something way before the doctors did, that when you forgive somebody, your blood pressure goes down. <sighs> let it go, let it go. Because your blood pressure goes down. You get physically well when you let it go. So let's sing it together. Let it go, let it go. I wanted to do that. Ellie, are you listening to me? Unresolved conflict hinders my happiness. You cannot be happy when you're in conflict. You can't. You could pretend that you're happy, but you cannot be happy. Your spirit is in turmoil. Emotionally, your heart is in chaos. And you cannot be happy. So how do we resolve conflict in our life? I'm going to start this morning. And if I don't finish, I'll pick it up next week. Number one, write this down. Learn how to be a peacemaker. In other words, initiate resolution. Initiate resolution. Jesus said, blessed... The word blessed there is happy. Blessed. In another translation, it's happy. Jesus said, happy is the peacemaker, for they are the children of God. 
you will never be happy until you learn how to initiate reconciliation in your life. Unhappy people, unsatisfied people, depressed people, discouraged people are people who have never learned how to initiate reconciliation in their lives. They've never learned how to navigate through conflict in their life. But real children of God, at their heart, they are peacemakers. Why? Because when we were born again and the Holy Spirit came to live inside of us, listen to me, we were created in the very image of Christ. And Christ is the ultimate peacemaker. The Bible tells us that Christ came and what did he do? He made peace with God for us. Corinthians 1 says, For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, Colossians said, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God, it says you were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. But now Christ has reconciled us by his physical body through death to present you holy in the sight of God without blemish and free from accusation. That when Jesus was dying on the cross, the very reason he died on the cross was because he initiated while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. When he was dying on the cross, he was saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And when he died on the cross, he initiated peace between you and God. He pulled the two parties together. The Bible says we were enemies of God under the wrath of God. But Christ, when he died on the cross, he initiated peace. And if you want to be like Jesus, how many of you have ever said, I want to be like Jesus? If you want to be like Jesus, you don't get a pass on that. You don't wait for the other person to come to you and ask for forgiveness. You initiate peace. What a world we'd live in. What a family we'd have if we all were committed to initiating peace. Oh, but I'm going to wait. I wasn't wrong. She was wrong. He was wrong. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't wait for us to come to our senses, but Jesus went to the cross and died on the cross and initiated peace for us? He is a peacemaker, and if we are a follower of Christ, we have to be committed to making peace. That's what the word means, to make peace. That means when there's no peace, you make peace. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, you're the funniest looking person I've ever seen in my life, but you're a peacemaker. You're a peacemaker. He said, don't wait for the other person to come to you. Don't ignore the conflict in your life. It's only going to get worse. Don't push the conflict under the carpet. It will always surface again and again. Don't pretend that the conflict doesn't exist in your marriage. Don't pretend that the conflict doesn't exist in your workplace. But deal with it. Deal with it as soon as you can. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't let a root of bitterness spring up lest you defile many. In fact, he says, let's get rid of it and get rid of it right away. What conflict are you dealing with right now in your life that you refuse to deal with? What conflict are you denying that exists right now in your marriage? What is it? Maybe it's sexual conflicts. Maybe it's money conflict. Maybe it's the kids. Maybe he likes the Mets and you like the Yankees. Maybe it's past hurts. Maybe it's communication Maybe it's value conflicts. Maybe it's work conflicts. Maybe it's church conflict. Maybe it's family conflict. Maybe it's outlaws. I mean in-laws. What problem are you sweeping under the carpet, pretending they're not there? Are you lying to yourself? Are you lying to your family, your spouse? Listen to me. Conflict never gets resolved accidentally. Time listen to me, does not heal all things. I know that we say time will heal. No, no, no. When it comes to conflict, look to me, time only makes it worse. That's the one thing that makes conflict even harder or worse. That's why Paul the Apostle says don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Because, see, here's what happens. When you're in a conflict with somebody and you're annoyed at somebody, 
Now all of a sudden, 1 Corinthians 13 doesn't work in your life. You don't believe all things are good in that person. So now you see that person in a negative light. So everything they do from that point on disturbs you. You don't have trust for that person. You look at that person with a distrust in your heart. So everything they do annoys you. And all of a sudden, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that little thing that they did, oh, they didn't say hello to me. And all of a sudden, it just be gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And now there's a wall between you and the person. That's why, listen what Jesus said. Here's what he says in Matthew. He says, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift, therefore, at the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Reconcile quickly with your adversary while you are still on the way to court. Otherwise, he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown in prison. Look what it says. He says, hurts turn into resentment. Resentment turns into bitterness. Bitterness turns into isolation. Isolation turns into hatred. Hatred turns into the poison that creates a disdain for the person. And sooner or later, the relationship is destroyed. And many times, the hatred turns into malicious gossip. And the hurt and the pain is passed on from one person to the next person. Jesus said, deal with it. Deal with it quickly. Get it out of your system. And keep the relationship whole. See, when I don't deal with the relationship, when I don't deal with the conflict, it just makes it worse. When we refuse to resolve conflict, it turns into bitterness and that destroys relationships. Notice what Jesus says. He says, if you don't deal with it quickly, then they're going to turn you over to the adversary. And they're going to take you and throw you in prison and you're going to pay every last penny. Notice, notice, notice that. That's, that's powerful. It's like, it's like if you would have dealt with it right away, it would be over. But as the bitterness grows, so does the hatred. And then all of a sudden, it's not like they just want to tell you off. Now, they want to they destroy your life. They want to destroy your name. They want to gossip about you. They want to hate you so much that they want to destroy you totally. It might even be 30 or 40 or 50 years later. But if you have never resolved that conflict, that bitterness will eat you alive. It will infect your life and destroy you. So we need to take the initiative in conflict resolution because it's not going to resolve itself. You must intentionally deal with it or it will deal with you. So if we're going to do that, we've got to overcome three things real quick. And I'm going to close right now as the worship team comes. We're going to take communion together. Number one, we have to deal with the fear of conflict. You see, the truth is no one likes conflict except for crazy makers. Normal people, sane people really don't like conflict. We like peace. We like to get along. We like stress-free living. So most of us tend to be afraid of conflict, and we tend to avoid conflict, but conflict never avoids us. So instead of dealing with the conflict, we do what we shouldn't do. We talk to someone else instead of the person that we're in conflict with. Do you know, the truth is there are grown men who are absolutely fearless in battle, Navy SEALs. They would face anything except for, honey, we need to talk. There's just something about conflict that strikes a chord in most of us of fear. We don't want to rock the boat. I love people. I mean, that's what I do. I, I love people. And the thing I hate to do is have that conversation. You know, that difficult conversation. Is there a difficult conversation you need to have with somebody? An honest conversation? that you're avoiding in your life. See, the truth is that most of us don't like conflict. Adam and Eve didn't like conflict. 
they actually, when God came into the garden, they hid because they had done something wrong and they didn't want to deal with the conflict. We actually don't fear the conflict as much as we actually fear being exposed. But that's the truth. We fear being hurt even more. We, feel being, we fear being rejected. We fear being, being wrong instead of being right. Losing the argument, losing control. We fear having to admit that we have a problem. We fear becoming vulnerable to somebody else. Having to say, I'm sorry, strikes a chord of fear in us. It's easier to, to avoid the conflict. It's easier to run from the conflict. It's easier to move on to the next relationship and start all over again. But the truth is, you can't start all over again. You have to deal with the conflict that's before you. That's why... You always have to face the conflict with courage. Cowards never resolve conflict. They walk away. But we see help in 2 Timothy chapter 1. God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. That means when we let God's spirit fill us, we'll have the power to love and the discipline to do what is right. 1 John chapter 4, let me read it again. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this commandment. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. So when, when we walk in perfect love, we can face every conflict with courage and confidence. Why? Because no matter what the outcome is, your security comes from knowing that God loves you with an everlasting love. As the ushers come forward, we're going to take communion this morning. And I waited Till the end of the sermon for us to take communion this morning for a reason. You see, once you've overcome the fear of confrontation, then the Bible is clear about how we're to deal with that confrontation. The Bible tells us that if a brother or sister sins against us, go point the fault out just between the two of you. Don't pull another person in, but just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two other along with you so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they, if they still refuse to listen, tell the church. And if they refuse to listen, even to the church, then treat them as you would as a pagan or tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree, come together about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in unity, in love, I am in your midst. Four things to consider. Choose the right time. Choose the right place. Pray before you meet. And have the right attitude. And then come together and be courageous enough to recognize that God calls us to initiate reconciliation in our life. I don't know what the outcome is going to be. You don't know what the outcome is going to be. I can't tell you how many times I've had to deal with conflict in my life. And the truth is, my part is to do what God called me to do. To be the initiator, to make that phone call, to write that letter, to meet with that person, to share. And you know what? If we're humble, we're not proud, the first thing we're going to do is take responsibility for our part. I have sinned. Maybe I missed something. Maybe I misunderstood. Maybe there's something I need to learn. And as we go in humility... We're like Christ who initiated peace for us. This morning, we're going to take communion. 
And you know, at the very heart of communion, look at me, at the, at the very heart of communion, there is reconciliation. At the very heart of communion, there is conflict resolution. You and I were in, were in a conflict with God. Jesus came and brought us peace so we could have everlasting life. So we're going to celebrate communion today. How many of you are so happy that Jesus was a peacemaker? Then can I be honest with you? Don't take this communion today. Don't take it. Pass it up. Pass it up. If you're not committed to being a peacemaker, if you're not going to be courageous enough to be obedient to God's word, to, to initiate reconciliation in relationships, pass it up. Because you can't take this without being a peacemaker. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. Jesus, thank you that you initiated peace for us, God. Lord, we ask this morning that you would give us the courage, Lord, to be peacemakers, oh God. Not to wait for somebody else, Lord, but to initiate peace in our life, God. Lord, help us to resolve the conflicts in our life, God. Lord, we may not have all the skills of communication, Lord. And God, we may even stutter over our conversation with that person because it's, it's a hard conversation. But ultimately, at the end of the day, there is no fear in perfect love, God. Because perfect love casts out all fear. And what we have today in our hands is a symbol, the emblem of perfect love. Your blood shed on the cross for us before we were reconciled to you, Lord. So touch us today, Lord. And help us, Lord God, to recognize, Lord, that you call us, Lord, to be peacemakers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may... At this time, distribute communion. And while they are distributing communion to you, I want you to take a moment. While you have that in your hands, I want you to take a moment and I want you to think, is there anybody in my life that I need to be reconciled to? Is there anyone that I need to have that tough conversation with? And I want you to hold that emblem in your hand and recognize there's power in the blood. There's power in the broken and healed body and resurrected body of Christ to give you strength to go to that person today. Don't let this, don't let this moment go by. Don't, let, don't say, hey, that was a great sermon. But if you're holding this in your hand and you're willing to take communion, then I want you to make a, con a commitment, conscious commitment that you will go and you will make it right with your brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible says, in the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is broken for you. We live in a broken world. We live in a world that is filled with dysfunction. And the truth is, the person that you are at odds with, they're a sinful person. They're dysfunctional just like we are. And they need grace in their life. And they need forgiveness in their life. And so I want you, as you hold this emblem in your hand, Vinny's going to pray. And he's going to pray a prayer of forgiveness. And if you have unforgiveness in your heart towards anyone, the Bible said, let us examine ourselves before we take of the symbol of the broken body of Christ. And if you have any unforgiveness, say, Lord, forgive me for that bitterness, that unforgiveness in my heart. I choose today to allow you to touch my heart and make me whole. Lord, we worship you and we look to you as we hold the bread in our hand, Lord, we, we know that when it comes to reconciliation, you lead the way in what it takes. 
that while we were distant from you, Lord Jesus, you had perfect eternal life already in heaven with the Father. You sacrificed that and took on flesh to be amongst us. Not to be amongst us and lead the way and how to act, but to be amongst us in living the perfect life we couldn't and still can't. And then willingly sacrificing your body for our behalf. And so that is the perfect example that you are willing to go above and beyond, that you are willing to sacrifice your own self over and over again. And so we pray and we look to you as our perfect substitute and as our example. Lord, help us to be like you in this area where we are willing to sacrifice it all for those to be reconciled. Help us to forgive those who have hurt us and, and, and been out to get us, Lord. God, you know sacrifice. We look to you and we worship you because of the sacrifice you made. Help us to be like you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us partake together in the name of Jesus. And in the same way, Christ lifted the cup and said, this is my blood that is poured out for you. And as often as you drink it, you do it in remembrance of me. There is no situation that is beyond the grace of God. There is no situation that God cannot bring healing. Paul said, as, as long as you're willing. And so maybe you're the person that's been unwilling. You're the person that's been distant, isolated. You're the one who's not been willing to work through the conflict. You've run from the conflict. God's saying to you today, stop running and face the conflict. And if you face the conflict, I will apply the blood of Jesus to that situation in your life. John said, if you confess your sins, God will be faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So as Pastor Tony prays for personal forgiveness, that you would stop running from the conflict and you would face the conflict, that God would give you strength and power by the blood that flows deeper than the hurt, higher than the challenge in your life. Lord Jesus, we give you praise and thanks this morning. For as you were nailed to the cross and as blood flowed from your body, you interceded and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so many of us, oh Lord God, struggle with forgiveness. We struggle with receiving your forgiveness. We struggle with forgiving ourselves, and we struggle with forgiving others. But your grace abounds. And as we take this moment to remember, to commemorate that which you have done for us. Help us to remember the reason. Help us to remember that we all need forgiveness. That we all need grace. Yes, Lord. And help us, oh Lord God, yes, Lord. to accept your forgiveness when we know how wretched we are. Yes. Help us to forgive ourselves, oh Lord God, and give us the courage and the boldness to not run from conflict, oh Lord God, but to face it, oh Lord God, yes. to work through it, oh Lord God, the way that you would work through it, the way that you want us to work through it, with mercy, with grace, and with forgiveness. And so as we drink from this cup, oh Lord God, be glorified in our lives, oh Lord God, and help us, O oh Lord God, that we might never, never forget your sacrifice. That we should always approach your table with thanksgiving, O oh Lord God, for all that you have done. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us partake together.
There's nothing more important than our life, than this message. The enemy wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy churches. He wants to destroy, rip us apart. And there's nothing more powerful that can happen in your life than you would commit to being a peacemaker. So I want to encourage you today as the altar counselors are coming. They're going to stand up here. The pastors are going to be here. We want to pray for you today. If you are right now in a place in your life where you say, I want to initiate peace. I want to live the rest of my life in peace. And I want to be a peacemaker. I want to live in the anointing of the Holy Spirit when it comes to conflict resolution. And you want prayer today. We want to pray for you. We want to lay hands on you and pray the anointing of the Holy Spirit on your life. I, I feel right now the anointing of God over this service and over your life. So we want to pray. So Father, bless us as we go today. Help everyone to know that you've got a great plan for their life and it's big. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have a great day in Jesus. If you need prayer, we want to pray for you. Just come forward right now.